All right, folks, um, welcome to those who've joined us for this program as we look at what the prophets have to say about health. And we're looking at the good news about health. Yes, there is some good news. That's what you'll be glad to know, I'm sure. Um, there are questions people ask. We all need to know the answers to these questions. Um, however, because some people get very stressed about the subject of health, I want to say right here at the outset that the prophets do not say anywhere that there's an ever-burning hell. Um, stay with me all the way through the program if you can, because I want you to understand for yourselves why I say that there's no ever-burning hell um, that the scripture prophets talk about at all. Um, I want to read the fine print too, so I need you to stay by where we do that. And as we consider these questions, what will happen to those who are going to be lost? Do they really burn in hell? These are important questions. Now, after Hitler came to power in Germany in 1933, he set up concentration camps and terrible things were done there and most of us will be acquainted with that. And this is simply a matter of history, but consider this for a moment. If God was to torture billions of people in hell for eternity, wouldn't he have to apologize to Hitler? Very important point there, folks. So we're going to be dealing with the subject tonight. To begin with, I want to know, what do the major world religions have to say about hell? And we have a, a group of them there on the screen. First of all, there are plenty of Christians who take this position, and I want to share it with you. It's a bit, it's a bit um, awe-inspiring here. And he, uh, this particular theologian says, every sinner, erring sinner, sorry, will be held like loathsome insects by the hand of God over the fiery pit of hell. And when they cry out for mercy, how will God respond? I don't know whether you find that appealing. I certainly do not. What about the Muslims? Well, this is what they say. As for those who disbelieve, garments of fire will be cut out for them. Boiling fluids will be poured down their heads. It makes you shudder to think about it. That's in the Quran. Um, so that's what the Muslims say. What about the Hindus? This is what they say. After death, messengers bring all beings to the court of Yama, where he passes judgment. So there's a judgment, according to the Hindus. He sends the virtuous to Svarga, which would correspond with heaven, as we'd understand it, and the sinners to one of the hells. After the quantum of punishment is over, the souls are reborn. So there's definitely an accounting uh, with the Hindus. But what about the Buddhists? Well, this is what they say. Hell is another temporary place where those who those evildoers experience more physical and mental suffering. They go on, there's no reason for those beings to suffer there forever, however. And uh, there's time spent there for suffering, but it doesn't last for all time. So we need to consider it because you and I want to know. All right. So here are the questions. Is hell real? Are there really people suffering in hell now as we speak? How can you have hell and a loving God? And that's a very important question, and I want to deal with that particular question first of all tonight. There are some things we need to understand to begin with, and this is the first one we want to see to, to look at, folks. Sin and rebellion against God has consequences, so justice must be done. Now, I think that it's fair to say that everybody has a keen sense of justice. Uh, this statement is worthy of checking out. The concept of justice runs deep in most of us, absolutely. Justice, quite simply, forms the foundation of a civilised society. Societies without just laws tend to be harsh and intolerant, often leading to conflict. And I thought that was a very insightful comment indeed to make. Um, we all believe in justice. God believes in justice also, and I think he's put it in us. And this is the scripture that we've read before in previous programs. The wages of sin is death. That's justice. But the gift of God is eternal life. Uh, that's a gift. Justice is not the pic in the picture there. But here lies the consequence for sin and rebellion. It's justice, folks. And it mightn't be a pleasant consequence. But this is the reality. We all know this to be true, don't we? This is something that all of us will face if time goes on long enough. So death is a simple consequence of people's choice. And we're talking about eternal death here. Um, and it's important to keep that in mind. 
Now, the book of Revelation takes us one step further. Now, we've just mentioned the fact that everybody dies, right? That's a consequence of sin and rebellion. But here's another statement. I want you to get this. It comes out of Revelation chapter 2 and verse 11. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, this is the first time any prophet has raised the issue of the second death, a second death. We all know that everyone dies the first death, but according to the prophet here, the second death is optional. We don't have to. And I want to talk tonight about how to avoid that. And I'm sure you'll be glad of that. Now, this is the order of events. I want us to get it in order in our minds exactly what God is doing with the human family when it comes to basically the end of it all. So these are the order of events, and this is Revelation chapter 20. We will be judged, each one according to his works. The things that we have done reveal what's going on in our lives and in our minds. And that's what the judgment looks at, what you've done. Anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, there is a fire, but it serves a very temporary purpose. And I want to stress that. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. This is referred to by the apostle and prophet John as the second death. So there's a second death, all right, and it follows the judgment. And yes, it's in a lake of fire. Now, don't get too panic struck about that, people, because we're going to make it very clear um, just what role this has. This is a statement in the book of Hebrews. As it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. When it says die once, he's referring to the fact that there's no second chance. We live our lives and then a judgment takes place, God's judgment. And then down the bottom here, after the judgment comes the second death for those who have not made their peace with God through Jesus. So here's the order. Up here on the right side, first of all, death. We experience death. Secondly, that is followed by a judgment, which for those who are lost, it's followed by the second death. Now, someone said to me, how can they how can they be in the judgment? See down the bottom here? How can they be in the judgment if they're dead? Okay, Jesus dealt with that, and this is what he said. He said, do not marvel at this. Um, in other words, don't be surprised about this. For the hour is coming in which all, notice the word all, all that are in the graves, that's the saint and the sinner, all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. He goes on. Those that have done good to the resurrection of life, those that have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Some translations say resurrection of damnation there. Now, not a pleasant thought. Okay, so there's a resurrection of everybody, a resurrection of those who are going to experience everlasting immortal life and a resurrection of those who are going to be resurrected for that judgment. And finally, the second death. Okay, here's the order of events now as we've seen them. First of all, death. We all know that. Secondly, there's a resurrection of everybody. A judgment. And then for those who are judged worthy of the second death, there's that. And that is the simple way that God has planned for things to happen. Um, it's not mysterious, people. It's just plain. Okay. So let's ask this question and try and answer that. Why is there a fire at all? The answer to that is that justice must be done. Now, we've already talked about the importance of justice, haven't we? Um, think about this. Think about Hitler, for example, this man right here, responsible for 50 million deaths. Can you get your mind around that? What about Stalin? He was responsible for 60 million deaths of his own people there in Russia. Um, Putin, th hundreds of thousands of deaths. Shouldn't there be justice for these crimes? And I think we'd all agree that, yes, there should be. But for the children of God, those who make their peace with God, who receive Jesus as their Savior, I'm going to talk a bit more about how to do that again tonight. This is what it says. Blessed is he or she who has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. Now, next in our next program, I'm going to explain how there are actually two separate resurrections. Um, and this, the Revelation chapter 20 deals with this. Um, one of the resurrections is for the righteous or the saints, and one is for the lost. 
and there are quite there's quite a time period between the two as we will see next week as we talk about it and there's a good reason why there's a time lapse between the two resurrections but if you're in the first resurrection which takes place at the second coming of jesus um you, you don't have to worry about the second death or the judgment for that matter okay now first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 the prophet writes the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. We have looked at this a few times now in our past programs. With the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And this is the first resurrection. Here's the promise. Those who have the Son have life. You see, Jesus is the source of life, the only source of life. Remember, he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. So that's where we have eternal life. Those who do not have the Son do not have life. It's as simple as that. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know. He wants us to have a certainty here. You may know that you have eternal life. No ifs and buts here, people. Um, that's the promise. You have Jesus. You have eternal life. God is the source of life. And as you can see down the bottom here, no life exists without God. I mean, he's our creator. He gave us life. To choose a life without God is to choose to forfeit life itself. It's as simple as that. So the result of hell is eternal death, not eternal life. And the choice, of course, is totally ours. Now, we're dealing with the question, how can we have hell and a loving God? And we've just dealt with point one. Sin has consequences Justice must be done. Let's deal with point number two now. Is God the kind of parent, because God presents himself as being a heavenly father, doesn't he? Is he the kind of parent that punishes more severely than the crime demands? Would that be justice? I'll put it to you, it would not be. Um, how can we have hell and a loving God? Well, we're dealing with it. Now, this is what Jesus himself said. I think it's very important to get this. He said, what man is there of you who, if his son should ask him for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would you give him a snake? The obvious answer is no, of course you wouldn't. Then he went on to say this, if you then, being evil, being sinners, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your father who is in heaven give good things to those that ask him? So in other words, um, if you, if you're just ordinary people, you naturally want to give good things to your children don't you think god is at least as fair as that well yes we do think that don't we um actually god is like jesus and we know jesus for the kind person of goodwill that he was do you remember what the angels sang when jesus was born peace on earth that's good we need that and goodwill towards men it's a beautiful word goodwill and that's how God feels towards us. And that's what he's trying to say. Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. In other words, what I am like, Jesus is saying, the Father in heaven is like. Well, that's encouraging. So we know what God is like. He's like Jesus. No parent would punish their child for hours for just eating, say, five cookies without asking. He wouldn't do that. Does God love any the less? No. He doesn't. He loves more, in fact. Justice demands the punishment must fit the crime. Nobody here amongst us would disagree with that, I am sure. Now, this is an important point. I want us to get this very clear in our minds. As I live, says the Lord, and this is Ezekiel quoting God here, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Folks, God does not want anybody to die. Now, the second death that we've been talking about is called, in the Bible, God's strange act, because he's the creator. But unless he deals with the problem of sin, we're stuck with it for the rest of eternity. On the bottom here, I've written, the view of an eternally burning hell is totally opposed to this picture of God as a loving parent. Now, I think you'd agree with that. Um, so this is what we're dealing with. Question was, how can we have hell, eternal hell, not just hell, eternally burning hell, and a loving God? And we dealt with point one, 
sin has consequences. Justice must be done. Point two we just dealt with is God the kind of parent who would punish more severely than the crime demands. And now we're going to deal with point number three. And I want us to get this very clear. Jesus suffered our death for us on Calvary. This is how much God wants to deliver us, if you like, from that second death. Um, and it always comes back to this. Jesus took our place and suffered so that we don't have to suffer. This is the prophet Isaiah. This is what he says. He was wounded for our transgressions. This is Jesus. This is a prophecy about what he would experience. He was bruised for our iniquities. It was because of our sins that he, was, he suffered. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. And then note this last point. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin, all the mistakes, dear friends, and all the, the wrong things that we've done. He's, re, he's put that all on him. Imagine feeling the guilt of everybody's mistakes and sins. No wonder it broke his heart and killed him. These are some of the scriptures I want us to note. He made him who knew no sin, like he didn't experience sin in himself. He was the only sinless human being. But he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He became the personification of sin. Now, when Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was put on the cross, the Garden of Gethsemane is in the Mount of Olives. It's still there. You can go there, and I've done that. And he went there to pray because he was sensing already the ordeal of the cross, carrying the sins of the world. And so he fell on his knees in prayer, and the sins of the world came upon him so that he was actually beginning to sweat great drops of blood. This is what the scripture said. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, when you start, when a person starts to sweat drops of blood, their body is breaking up. This is what was happening to Jesus as the sins of the world settled upon him, even there in the garden of Gethsemane. And folks, he fell dying to the ground. And the scripture tells us that an angel came and strengthened him had he not done that, well, Jesus would never have made it to the cross, dear friends. He was already dying there in the garden from the sins of the world. It's hard for us to, well, you cannot understand that. Yes, you and I have felt guilty from the dumb things we've done sometimes, but Jesus carried it all and the full penalty of it. No wonder it killed him on that cross. As he was dying on the cross, this is the next day now, it was three o'clock in the afternoon. He was put on the cross at nine and he died at three. How do we know that? Because there were two sacrifices conducted in the sanctuary every day, dear friends, and they were conducted at nine o'clock in the morning and it was called the morning sacrifice and at three o'clock in the afternoon and it was called the evening sacrifice. Isn't that amazing? So we knew that that's what would happen. And what is more, Jesus knew that that's what would happen. And as three o'clock approached, he cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what was happening to Jesus that he should do that? This is what was happening. Remember, the sins of the world were upon him. And he felt this just separating him from his father in heaven. Your iniquities have separated you from your God, Isaiah wrote. Your sins have hidden his face from you. This is what Jesus experienced. Remember, the wages of sin is death. Now, Jesus knew that, and he experienced this for us. Jesus felt within himself that sin was so bad that there was no hope for him after he died. He felt abandoned by God, and he thought it was all over for him. Um, and the measure of his amazing love for us is that despite the potential loss to himself, he stayed on that cross. And you may recall, if you know the story, that those who were opposed to him mocked him on the cross. And they said, let him come down from the cross if he's the son of God, and we'll believe him then. Of course, they wouldn't. But of course, the fact that he stayed there was what our hope is dependent on, folks, because he paid the full price for our sins. Amazing grace. Christ was willing to die eternally, for you and for me. And I think that is just amazing that he would be prepared to do that. And there's some guarantees come to us because of this. 
because Jesus took your sin, you will never be forsaken by God, never. Now, what a wonderful assurance that is. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What more can a loving God do for his children than what he has done so that there's no second death in the lake of fire? I mean, he went through all that so that that just would not happen for anybody. And we can come as we are to him. I don't care what any of us have done. And uh, we've all done things that we regret and are ashamed of even. I have. And folks, Jesus will take you when you come to him and will clean you up and he'll give you a place in his coming kingdom. And I'll tell you what, you can't get any better than that. So that was the question. How can we have a hell, ever-burning hell, and a loving God? Well, we found out that sin has consequences. God's a loving parent, and he took our death on Calvary. And note this, not a single person, not a single human being, needs suffer the second death. If anybody does, it'll be their own choice that that's the case. What more could God do? He's done everything he could do. So, my friends, there will be justice for the wicked and there will be a fire, but it doesn't burn forever, only until it accomplishes the second death. And I want to stress this, the most it will be instantaneous. A lot of people not interested in God, not interested in eternity. I've had people tell me that. Um, but they're not bad people either, particularly. This is what the scripture says. The Son of Man shall send his angels at his second coming, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that cause stumbling and those that sin and will throw them into the furnace of fire. And it's not a pleasant thought that God has done everything to keep that from happening. Then Revelation 20, verse 14 and 15, they make this statement. Death and hell. Now, this is not a good translation. This is, word is translated by people who believed in an eternally burning hell. So naturally, that's the word they used. But the word is Hades, and it simply means the grave. So death and the grave were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Why a second death? Remember, there was a death, a resurrection for everybody, including the lost, judgment, and then the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And your name is written in that book when you say, yes, Lord, I want to give my life to Jesus and accept him as my savior. It's a simple transaction, as simple as that. Now, I want you to think about this. If God is unable to destroy the wicked, then this world will continue as it is forever and forever and get worse and worse. That's the only alternative. So in order for God to bring the whole thing to a halt, he's got to be able to judge the world. This is interesting. The Apostle Peter talks about this fire and he adds this. I want you to note this. It's really interesting. The day of the Lord will come, he says in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The elements, the very basic stuff of which the earth is made, the rocks, the soil, the, the very elements themselves, melt with fervent heat. So this lake of fire spreads across the earth and there's a huge meltdown. The earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The whole earth goes into meltdown. Now there's a reason for this. And by the way, this is why this fire not only destroys the wicked, but cleanses the earth of disease and pollution. You know, all that makes life miserable today, the sickness, the disease, it's all got to be, you know, all the germs, et cetera, et cetera, they're all got to be cleansed away and the fire will do it. Fire is the best antiseptic there is in the world and it will be all gone. And then when the lake of fire has done its work, the earth and humanity have been cleansed as a result and Jesus will make it all new. And we've talked about this in previous programs, haven't we? This is Jesus' very plain promise. Blessed are the meek. It's not the big people of the earth. It's not the important people, the beautiful people. Just those who quietly, humbly trust in God and rest in what God plans to do. It says they shall inherit the earth. And it will be a new earth, people. You won't have to pay the rest of your life using it or paying off a mortgage for this one it'll be a gift blessed are the meek they'll inherit the earth we just read john added in vision revelation 21 1 i saw a new heaven and a new earth the first heaven and the first earth are passed away 
and there was no more sea. Remember looking at this before as well. And we more, we talked about the sea, how it's just waste space. And God is going to remove that. It's the leftover of the great flood. I love this promise, don't you? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise. Now, God always keeps his promise. You'd expect him to, and he does. We look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. What a place. Um, and we can look forward to that. So the second death in the lake of fire is the consequence, one, of disconnecting from Christ, our Redeemer, and God. Two, it's the consequence of using our freedom to say no to God, and God will let you do that if you choose. Three, it's the consequence of wickedness. That's what the second death is all about. Now, I want to deal with a question here at this point about the meaning of forever and ever, because there are some places in the Bible where it says things like that. For example, this one. He will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Yes, that's where he's going. And then this one. They will be tormented day and night forever. What is the meaning of that? Surely that's meaning for all time. Uh, that's scary, isn't it? No. I want you to notice the meaning of the word forever and ever. Um, the New Testament was written in Greek. Greek was the lingua franca of the world of Jesus' time. Everybody spoke Greek as well as other languages and their own languages. Um, the New Testament, all written in Greek. And this is what the Greek actually says. Eis, eonas, eonan. Now, I could check with this with my friend Yanni, who's down in Tasmania, uh, who's been watching these programs. Um, and, folks, this word is um, into or unto, and this just word just means age, another word, age too. Literally, unto ages and ages. Um, and a better translation, an accurate translation, instead of forever and forever, would be for ages and ages. Now, I hope you got that. Um, the word simply means age. So literally down the bottom here, further down, literal meaning of forever is, and this is the Greek, east tone aona, which means into, that's the word for our definite article, the, into the age, which is, and we just simply translate that for ages. So it doesn't mean for all time. I want to make this very clear. It might mean for ages or for ages and ages. And interestingly, our English word eon, we talk about an eon of time, don't we? Directly comes from the Greek. Use that Greek word in exactly the same way as the Greeks did. It means an age. Um, and it means exactly the same as the Greek word, an indeterminate length of time. Um, an age, when we say an age of time, we're not saying exactly how long, because we don't know. So it's just a period of time. Um, you've got to look at the context to understand how long the eon is. Um, here's one illustration of it. This is the story of Jonah. Remember Jonah was thrown into the water and he was swallowed by a whale. And this is what he wrote later about his experience. The water surrounded me. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Literally, for ages, right? Remember that? How long was the ages that he was in the water? Jonah, he says, was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. When I say it's a whale, it was actually a fish. Don't know what kind of fish. We often use the word whale, but it could have been anything. And he was there for three days and three nights. That, to him, was forever. In other words, for ages. I expect it felt like a fairly long time if you're in the belly of a big fish. Here's another illustration of that point. The Bible says Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed with eternal fire. Now, it's the same word, eon, here again. And uh, this is what it says again. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over <laughs> pardon me, to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example. Excuse me a moment. <laughs> Adam's Zion, beautiful stuff. Set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, eternal, age-lasting fire. Now, a simple question is, are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning? Clearly not. This is what um, the Apostle Peter says in the New Testament. 
God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes and condemned them to destruction. So they were, they were turned to ashes, folks. Um, they didn't burn forever and ever. They burned for an age. In other words, for as long as it took to burn them up. That's what the age is. So the results are up for fire are definitely for all time, but not the process of burning. I hope we got that nice and clear. This is a fascinating parallel here. And there's a parallel between Sodom's destruction and the lake of fire at the end of time. And this is what it says in Genesis. The Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire came down from God out of heaven. Talking about the lake of fire, it says pretty much the same thing. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And uh, that's pretty clear, isn't it? So it's the same kind of thing. This is another word that's used, and I want to mention this. Um, this is Jesus talking. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now, he's talking metaphorically here. Better for you to go into life maimed rather than having two hands to go into hell, Hades, the grave, into the fire that shall never be quenched. That is, it can't be put out. That's the point here. Um, this illustrates it. Um, Jeremiah made this prophecy about Jerusalem. The people of Israel had turned away from God during this period of time, and some very wicked things were happening there. And so God raised up these prophets, and he said to the people, I will kindle a fire in its gates. That's the gates of Jerusalem. It shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and shall not be quenched. Um, this illustrates the meaning or the use of the word quenched here, because Jerusalem was to be burnt to the ground, was actually Nebuchadnezzar who did this in the year 586 BC. And the whole city was burnt to the ground. And in recent times, archaeologists have un unearthed this, what they call the burnt room. They found it six metres below street level, which is interesting. Um, still burning? Definitely not. This is the result of the fire that couldn't be quenched. In other words, it couldn't be quenched until it done its job. And, uh, and what happened was that the whole of Jerusalem was burnt terribly to the ground. And that's just simply the leftover. Talking about the wicked at the end of time, the day is coming burning as a furnace and all the proud and all that do wickedness shall be stubble. And the day that is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. And it's going to be complete. Continuing on with that statement, that it will leave them neither root nor branch and you shall tread down the wicked. They shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do this, says the Lord. So they're going to be ashes. They're not going to be living on um, in, in agony in the flames. I hope we've got that clear. Even Lucifer, who, as we've already seen, is going to end up in the same lake of fire. He knows that. Um, and uh, I, it's, it hasn't helped him to reform his life, unfortunately. Anyhow, talking about him. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. That's the prophet Ezekiel saying that. He goes on to say, therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you. I burned you to ashes. Of course, this is talking prophetically here. Hasn't happened yet. Burned you to ashes upon the earth. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Um, that's good to know. So he's going to be reduced to ashes eventually. So let's do a little summary here. Eternal torment in hell denies the truth about death. I want you to understand this, folks. The wages of sin is death, not life, no matter how poor the quality of life would be if you were in the lake of fire. And so it's not eternal life in fire. It's eternal death. Uh, this is not a joke. It's a promise. The living know they shall die, but the dead know nothing. And if you've had a, a long and eventful and hard life, folks, you won't mind sleeping until the resurrection. Eternal, dormant, eternal torment in hell, on the other hand, denies the gospel of Jesus, um, who says, A, the wages of him is death, and B, if we come to him, we may have eternal life. Not only that, immortal life. Here's Jesus' statement. He said, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish. You see, folks, it's not ever burning life, it's perish. 
not perish, but have everlasting life. I think we've got that pretty clear. Um, by the way, you have when you believe you have eternal life or everlasting life, that can be interrupted by death. We're all going to die, as we've already mentioned, and no, but not immortal life. See, we're not given immortal life the moment we come to Jesus. That is not given to us until Jesus' second coming. And after that, there's no more death, folks. That's going to be clear. Now, this is interesting. There are three very interesting theologians in the world. Clark Pinnock, who's a Pentecostal theologian. Hans Kung, who is a Roman Catholic theologian. And John Stott, who is a Church of England theologian. Past tense now, he's passed away. All of these high-profile theologians have come to this biblical view of eternal death known as the annihilationist view. It actually has a name. And uh, I want to just quote to you from what Clark, Clark Pinnock, the Pentecostal theologian, says. That's very pertinent here. He said this, Everlasting torture is intolerable, he said, from a moral point of view, because it pictures God acting like a bloodthirsty monster who maintains an everlasting Auschwitz for his enemies whom he does not even allow to die. I suppose one might be afraid of a God like that, but could we love and respect him? Very pertinent question. He goes on to say this. Anthony Flew, who was a prominent atheist, was right to object that if Christians really believe that God created people with the full intention of torturing some of them in hell forever, they might as well give up the effort to defend Christianity. Well, I actually agree with that. Uh, that makes very good sense. And so this is the view the scripture takes. Well, back to the good news. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have, a, have everlasting life. That's God's plan for you. Let's run through those promises quickly again. Those who have the Son have life. Talking about eternal life, of course. Those who do not have the Son do not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, that is, have total confidence that you have eternal life. None of us need to finish this program tonight and not be quite confident, dear friends, that we have eternal life because we're trusting in Jesus. Yes, we know who we are, but we also know who he is. Do not marvel at this. Jesus' own words. The hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and come forth. Reading straight on. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. He's going to call your name to call my name. He knows all his children, dear friends, and he will call us from our dusty beds and he will grant us to have immortality, not subject to death. And with all immortality, of course, goes perfect health, um, perfect mental abilities, perfect physical abilities, everything that we possibly need. It's all summarized here in Revelation. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. No need for them, you see. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying, no grieving, no more pain, for the former things have passed away. All will be at peace. Sin and sinners will be no more. One pulse of harmony will exist throughout the entire universe that God has made. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And when you're dealing with everybody who's a righteous, holy person, what lovely people they're going to be. And you'll be able to trust them, everyone, a person of 100% integrity and kindness and love. Wow, I can hardly imagine it. This one again by Isaiah, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Suffering and disability, things of the past. In God's glorious new earth, and he's got an inheritance for you there and for me. We shall see his face. Do you imagine the seeing God face to face? Imagine seeing Jesus, the glorified Jesus, face to face, the one who loved us so much. He became one with the human family to share our lot in life, to die our death, and to lead us 
out of the grave, back into eternal life again. Well, I'd like to invite you to share with me in a prayer to close tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that your son Jesus came to this earth to give us a way out of the dilemma we find ourselves in. We thank you that not a single human being need go into that lake of fire and suffer that second death. I pray for every person who's tuning into this program tonight and on YouTube, that everybody's heart will be open to you and that you will take note of their names, write them in your book of life, redeem them when Jesus comes back. And should we go to our rest in the grave before then, that you'll call our names, we know. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Now, our next program that we're going to deal with next week is entitled 1,000 Years of Peace. Not bad in a world that's never known a moment's peace. We can look forward to that. It's otherwise known as the millennium. And we're going to discuss that next week. And I think you're going to find that absolutely riveting. God bless. Look forward to seeing you then.